Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Kevin, and I'm one of the pastors here at Real Life Church. And along with the rest of our team, I just want to say I'm so glad that you chose to connect with us today, especially if you're an incoming seventh grader or an incoming ninth grader and you're new to our community. I want you to know that this is a great place for you to take your next step in finding and following after Jesus. And I want you to know I'm praying for you as you're jumping in. Man, can you guys believe that summer is wrapping up and we're heading into a new school year? I was thinking back to my first day of seventh grade a long, long time ago. And back when I was going into junior high, Stussy was like the really cool gear to wear. And so my mom took my twin brother and I out shopping. We got to buy one new shirt and one new pair of pants. And I bought, of course, a red Stussy shirt. Not one of the fake ones, because back then there were like fake off-brand Stussy shirts where the S was kind of sideways or backwards. It was a legit Stussy shirt. And on that first day of school, I got all dressed up, threw on my red shirt, threw on my jean shorts, threw on my Nike shoes, and I was, I was excited and I was terrified. And so I want you to know, if you're heading into junior high, if you're heading into high school, and you're excited and probably a little bit terrified, I'm praying for you, and it's totally normal. But here's the crazy thing. Junior high feels like it was just yesterday, but now my oldest is going into junior high. And so I just got to ask you guys, help me out. Help me stay somewhat current. Can you just drop something in the chat and let me know, like, what's the cool clothing to wear today? It was Stussy 30 years ago. What is it today? Help a brother out. And if it's not Volcom, please just be kind with me because I'm trying and I'm learning. Go ahead, take that second and drop it in the chat. Well, man, we're heading into uncertain times. We're heading into new times. And the truth is, whether you're a seventh grader or all the way up to a 12th grader, this fall is not the way any of us would have planned it. It's uncertain. And sometimes uncertainty can be really, really difficult. And we're in this series right now called True Story, where we're looking at true stories in the scripture of women and men who followed after God and we're learning about who God is, and because of who God is, we're learning about who we are and who we were made to be. And the good news is that if this new season, this uncertain season feels difficult to you, you're in good company because God created you to do difficult things. Don't believe me? Well, we're going to peek in on a guy who went through some incredibly difficult circumstances, both externally and internally. And God walked with him, and God gave him the ability to do the difficult things that God was calling him to do. But before we look at his true story, I want us to look at a not-so-true story about five superheroes from the movie Incredibles. Now, in the movie The Incredibles, mom and dad and the two older siblings have figured out what their superpowers are, but the little brother has not figured out his superpowers. But once he figures out who he is on the inside, it changes everything about his life. The Bible doesn't have superheroes necessarily. It does have a miraculous God who works miraculously in the lives of his people in unexpected ways. And I want to talk about one guy in the Bible who went through some really, really difficult times, but because of who God is and who God made him to be, he was able to walk through those difficult times and not just survive, but actually thrive. His name's Elijah, and he was a prophet in the Old Testament of the Bible, who lived about 900 BC. And the role of a prophet was a prophet would hear from God, and then he would speak that truth out to the people, usually to the kings and the people in power. But most of the time, the prophet would would say things that the people in power didn't want to hear. So prophets weren't overly popular, and that's Eliza's, Eliza, Elijah's problem. So he goes to this king, this this. A Jewish king named Ahab, and Ahab's married a woman named Jezebel. And together, they kind of married their religions together. See, Ahab believed in the God of the Bible. I'll call him the capital G God or the OG, the original God. Come on, that's good. Now, Jezebel had a different God that she followed, a lowercase g God. And Ahab and Jezebel figured, well, if one God is good, two gods are probably better. The problem is that the God of the Bible was not happy with this arrangement, and so he caused a drought to come over the land. Because the God that we find in the pages of Scripture is not like any other God, not like any other religion. There are great things in world religions, truths that we can transfer into our lives, 
But when it comes to who God is and what God does in our lives, the God of the Bible stands apart. And Jesus talks about that in other world religions. They don't claim to do the same things that Christianity does or to believe the same things because the God of the Bible, he's the OG. He's the original God. And so uh, Elijah comes to the king and he says, this famine is being caused because of you. And because God is not happy with you marrying all these different kind of gods and religions together. And if you don't believe me, I want to challenge the prophets and the priests of this other God called Baal or Baal to a test to see whose God is the power, most powerful God. And we pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 20. We're going to go all the way to, through to verse 26. And here's the thing. It's a story. So just kind of listen to it. Maybe even close your eyes and let yourself get into that space where you can picture these things happening because it's a pretty epic story. Verse 20 starts out like this. So Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and he assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. We're going to find out in a few minutes there were 450 prophets of Baal or of Baal, plus another 400 from a different religious background just to kind of give them support. So 850 prophets against one. And Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. So here's the plan. Let's get two bulls, let, the, let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves. They'll let them cut it into little tiny pieces. I know that's kind of gross, but just let it go. Let them cut it into little tiny pieces and then place firewood underneath it. And I'll prepare the other bowl and I'll put it on wood. Verse 24 says this. Then he says to the prophets of Baal, you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of my God. The God who answers by fire, he is the true God. And all the people said, that sounds good. So this is a big deal. Talk about something difficult. We've got one guy, Elijah, going up against 850 priests and prophets of Baal. And if God doesn't come through on Elijah's behalf, Elijah is dead. I mean, there's no coming back from this. But he steps up. He says, I trust that God's going to do something. I trust that God's going to take care of me and that God's going to come through big. It goes on to say this in verse 25. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bowls and prepare it. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bowl given to them and they prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning all the way up until noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted out. But there was no response. No one answered. And at this point, Elijah starts to feel pretty good about himself. So he starts taunting them. He's like, well, maybe your God went on vacation. Maybe your God's sleeping. Maybe your God's just busy thinking about deep things. But you know what your God's not doing? Your God is not answering you. So then it's Elijah's turn. So Elijah prays, answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you are the Lord and God, and that they may turn their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord came down and it burned up the sacrifice. It burned the wood, the stones, the soil, and it licked up all the water because there was water in a trench around the sacrifice. When the people saw this, they fell prostrate, which means they fell down flat and they cried out, the Lord, the Lord, he is God. Elijah takes a huge step against all odds, against everyone being against him. I mean, we had 850 prophets, then probably a couple thousand people who were spectators watching this, and everybody was against Elijah. He prays, and God shows up big time. And God shows us some things about himself that we can count on when we come to God and when we pray. The first is this. We can trust that God hears our prayers. God is close enough to hear you when you pray. We know that God can be trusted that when God says God's going to do something, he's going to show up and he's going to do it. We see from this that God is powerful. 
He's strong, stronger than the, the lowercase g gods. He's the OG, the original God. He's number one. And we realize that he's the only true God and the only God who can save. Now, if we know that God is like that, wouldn't it make sense that we can do difficult things? We've got a big God, a powerful God, a God that's close enough to hear us. Of course. And Elijah did. He trusted God for big things, and God did big things. But then Elijah gets alone, and he completely freaks out. I don't know if you've ever had one of these moments, but let me just ask. Have you ever had a time where, like, you gave a great speech, and then you walked away, and you just started going through everything you said and thinking about how you said things wrong and what are people going to think? I'll let you in on a little secret. Pretty much every time I communicate, I walk off of a stage or I walk away from a camera, and I, I know I said something dumb, and I'm a little bit embarrassed. It just happens every time. In fact, this is probably that time right now. Or how about this? Maybe you stood up for someone being bullied, and in the moment you knew you were doing the right thing, but then you leave and you wonder, what are people going to think about me? Is that bully going to come after me now? Maybe you passed a note to a girl or a guy that you liked, and you know it was delivered, but you haven't heard anything back, and then you just start to wonder what's going to happen, what's going to happen. Maybe you tried out for a team or for a play, you got the part, but now you have to actually come through and do it. See, we would think Elijah would be on cloud nine right now. He stepped up. He did the difficult thing. God showed up on his behalf. But then he gets away quietly by himself and doubt starts to creep in and questioning starts to creep in and despair starts to creep in. You ever felt that way? Alone, questioning, scared, maybe hopeless? If you have, I need you to tune back in. Come on. Tune in right here because you need to know this part of Elijah's story because God says something right here that was as true for us today as it was for Elijah in 900 BC. He says this, we find out that Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. When he came to a place called Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to some brush. He sat under a tree and he prayed that he might die. The dude is in the depths of hopelessness. He says, I've had enough, Lord. Take me out of this life. I'm no better than any of your other prophets. Then he laid down under a tree and he fell asleep. At once an angel of the Lord touched him. Get up and eat. And he looked over and there he saw some bread and he saw some water, and he ate and he drank. Here's the truth. You might find yourself in places now, a year from now, 10 years from now, where you can't see the end of the story. And it feels scary, and you feel alone, and maybe you feel hopeless. But the truth about God is, God always sees the end of the story, and he knows the plans that he has for you. And he's not going to leave you where you are. So he wakes up Elijah, he gives him something to eat, something to drink, and then Elisha goes back to bed again because apparently it was like a Thanksgiving meal and he got tired afterwards. So he goes back to bed again. Verse 7 says this of 1 Kings chapter 19. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him. Get up and eat uh, for you have a journey ahead of you. So he got up and he ate and drank and he was strengthened and he took a 40-day journey. And then he got to a cave and he spent the night. And when he was in that cave at night, the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? The Lord asked him. He replied, I've been so loyal to you, God. But the Israelites have rejected you. They've torn down your altars. They've put your prophets to death. And now I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me too. Translation, God, I did everything you asked me to. I did the difficult thing. I took the stand and things just keep getting harder. Then the Lord said, Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of God, for the Lord is about to pass you by. And then we're told there was uh, a great and powerful wind that tore the mountains apart. It shattered rocks before the Lord, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake and it shook everything, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake came fire, but the Lord was not in 
the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And the Lord was in the whisper. Now this isn't a different God from that big God who caused fire to come down and burn up the altar. It's just a different side of the same God. Because God sees you and he knows you. He knows when you need strength and he knows when you need caring. This part of the story tells us that God, God's understanding. God's gentle. God gives us what we need. Sometimes it's courage to take a stand and sometimes it's comfort when we're hurting. God is with us and he speaks to us right where we are. Friends, you and I can do difficult things because God doesn't take us out of difficult situations. God gives us what we need in the midst of them. So what's this look like for you and I? As we head into this fall semester, it could look like just setting up regular rhythms of spending time daily with God. Not for the purpose of checking something off your list, but for the purpose of getting to know this God who's with you in every situation. It could look like making wise choices in the midst of voices pulling you in all kinds of different directions. Doing difficult things in partnership with God could look like being honest with your parents, or one of your YX staff, or maybe it's your small group leader about something you're struggling with. Maybe it's a lie you've been holding on to that, man, you just keep spinning it and you're digging deeper and deeper. Or maybe it's emotions, things like anxiety, depression, anger, fear, uncertainty. Sharing those feelings can be really difficult. And God wants to bring those things into the light so that you don't have to hold them by yourself. He wants to walk with you through them. Maybe it's processing the loss of a loved one from this past season of your life. Maybe it's taking a risk, doing something new that you know God's calling you to do. I, I don't know what your next step is, but I promise you, whatever that thing is, even if it feels difficult, even if it feels big, or even if you feel alone, you're never alone. And you can do difficult things because God is with you. I want to leave us with two promises of Jesus before I pray for you. And they come out of John chapter 16, verse 33. The first is a not so great promise. The second one is a promise that is so good that we just need to hold on to it every single day. John 16 says this, Jesus says, I've told you these things so that you might have peace. As you head into the fall, friends, I want you to experience peace in your life, even in the midst of uncertainty. Jesus goes on to say, in this world, you're going to have trouble. You just are. It's going to come. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. So bad news first. In this world, we're going to have trouble. We're going to face uncertainty. We're going to face hard things, difficult things. It just is. Good news, Jesus says, I've overcome the world. I'm bigger than than the trouble. I'm bigger than the difficulty. I'm bigger than the fear and the loneliness. And I will be with you always. Always. There's never anywhere you could go. If you retreat into yourself, God's going to be there. If you try to go and be alone, God's there. If you feel like no one understands you, guess what? Jesus does and God's there. And because God's there, you and I can do difficult things. Let me pray for us. Lord, so many of my friends are heading into new and uncharted territory. And there's uncertainty around it, and there's questions around it. For some of us, we're very excited about this new. For some of us, uh, we're grieving the loss of what was. And so I, I'm asking you, God, would you work in the lives of my friends? Would you remind them every moment of the day starting now, moving into this week, and in the weeks and months to come, would you remind every one of us that you are with us right now? And would you give us what we need, just like you did to Elijah? If we need you to be big and strong and help us stand up in the crowd, would you give us the courage to do that? If we need you to be gentle and to listen and to encourage us and to give us just that little bit that we need for the moment, would you do that? 
God, would you come through on your promise that you've overcome the world and that you're with us always. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.